Supreme Court of Washington is now in session. Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to the Washington Supreme Court. Today is January 26th of 2023. We're hearing two cases in person here in our temporary facilities in Tumwater. The first case was granted extra time, so there are 30 minutes per side instead of the usual uh, 20 minutes. That first case is Chris Quinn et al. versus the state of Washington, the state being the appellants. Opening for the state is Noah Purcell for 15 minutes and Paul Lawrence for eight, with a response from Callie Ann Castillo for 20 and Robert McKenna for 10, with rebuttal reserved seven minutes for Noah Purcell. Council, please proceed. Chief Justice Gonzalez, and may it please the court. Our legislature enacted the capital gains excise tax to fund education and to help rebalance our state's tax code to make it less slanted against low and middle income people. The plaintiffs in this case are asking you to overturn that legislative judgment, but they have come nowhere close to meeting their burden of proving this tax unconstitutional. And the plaintiffs offer three arguments, and I'll address each one in turn. But first, to explain why their arguments are so flawed, I wanna briefly recap how the tax operates. The capital gains excise tax applies only when a person sells certain types of assets, such as stocks and bonds, and receives a gain of over a quarter of a million dollars in a single year. The tax does not apply to sales of real estate, uh, farmland, retirement assets, and because of the tax's exemptions and deductions, less than one in 1,000 Washingtonians will pay the tax in any given year. Now, these features of the tax help demonstrate why plaintiff's first argument their claim that this is a property tax is so clearly wrong under this court's precedent. Since the 1930s, this court has held over and over again that a property tax is a tax that a person owes just because they own property. I and that their first argument is that this is an excise tax rather than an income tax. And I think your summary of the tax and the fact that stocks and bonds sold on an exchange that's outside of Washington or the subject of the tax weighs against your argument, doesn't it? Uh, no, Your Honor, so sorry, their, their argument is that this is a property tax and our argument is that this is an excise tax and the fact- I'm sorry, I was there, okay. I switched you around. Okay, sorry, um, I just wanna make sure I understand the question. My fault. Their argument is that it's an income tax mm -hmm. rather than an excise tax. And I view a tax on a transaction um, certainly, as you do, as an excise tax. But we don't tax transactions in other states. We tax transactions in our state. We might tra tax income if it were permitted under the Washington Constitution, if that income came from a transaction in another state. But that would be an income tax, not an excise tax. And I think their first argument is not necessarily that it's property, yet, but that it's income tax rather than excise tax. Well, Your Honor, it's very clear under the U.S. Supreme Court's case law and this court's case law that states have authority to tax sales of intangible property that happen elsewhere if it's done by a person who's domiciled in the state. And for example, the inheritance tax that this court unanimously held was an, estate, was an excise tax, sorry, in Brooklyn's estate, it didn't matter where the person passed away. Uh, what mattered was that a person here received the inheritance and then they owed the tax. And Similarly, tax let, me, let me just remind everyone to turn the mics on on the bench if you're speaking. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. So the mic didn't pick up my misstatement earlier. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, so, so and, and similarly with the current estate tax, it, it again does not. Uh, the the state owes the tax regardless of where the the uh, where the money goes. And so, the the key thing is that there is a transaction or a transfer that's being taxed, and that's what makes it an excise tax. So clearly, under this court's case law. But in that case, the entire the value of the entire estate was being taxed, and in this case, it's only the gain, which I think supports their argument that it's a tax on income rather than a tax on the entirety of the transaction. And I understand your answer is that, oh no, that's just how we're valuing the tax. But the fact of the matter is that if I sold stock on the New York Stock Exchange and took a loss, 
you wouldn't be taxing that. Well, Your Honor, a couple of points about that. First of all, the estate tax does involve actually a netting of profit and loss. So the, the assets are, uh, the liabilities are netted out before you apply the tax. So that is an example of where it's not just a gross value. And the other key point there, Your Honor, is that the other side is saying that if something is applied to a profit, it must be a property tax. But if something is applied to a gross value, then it can be an excise tax. But the fundamental, most basic example of a property tax that we have in this state, the, the ad valorem property taxes that people pay on their homes or their business property, is based on a gross amount. You just pay based on the value of your property. It has nothing to do with profits. So the idea that if something is based on profits, it must be a property tax, it has no basis in the case law or in, in logic. There's no case that says that. And so, you know, they've, they've kind of made that argument, but it, it just doesn't have a basis in the case law. Can you explain the, the relationship, if any, um, of your argument that this is an excise tax to arguments about the definition of property and, in particular, intangible property? There's discussion in other briefing. I'm not sure it's in the state's briefing about property as an expected, or excuse me, income as an expectancy, doesn't meet the definition of property, et cetera. Does your argument that this is an excise tax require the court to consider the nature of income? No, Your Honor, because the court has held many times that a transaction can be taxed even if it generates income. So, for example, the real estate excise tax, when someone sells real estate, whether it's their home or rental property, they obviously earn income from selling that property, but nonetheless they owe the real estate excise tax on that transaction. When a small business owner, a small business owner like a plumber or an accountant earns their income from their small business, but nonetheless they owe the business and occupation tax on the business's income. And so the fact that a person generates income by engaging in a transaction does not mean that a tax on that transaction becomes an income tax or a property tax. And this court's case law is very clear about that. So regardless of kind of how you treat income, the fact that the transaction generates income does not turn this into a property tax. And, and again, I, I would say maybe the most straightforward example of that is the real estate excise tax that this court unanimously upheld in the Mahler case. There, obviously, the underlying asset is property. It's real property. It's your home or it's a rental property that you own, and you own it and you owe property taxes every year on it. But then when you go to sell it, you owe the real estate excise tax, and that is, this court unanimously held, an excise tax, even though there's no dispute that the underlying property is property and there's no dispute that you get income from selling the property. Wasn't that a case where the tax was on the sale of property wholly within the state of Washington? Um, and it was therefore characterized as an excise tax because the state of Washington can properly tax transactions in the state of Washington. And I think it upheld a tax on the transaction itself based on the value of the unit of property sold without regard to whether there was a gain of loss, which is also different from what we have in this case. Well, it's true that the real estate excise tax only applies to sales of real estate in Washington. But again, it's, it's black letter law that states have authority to tax transactions that happen outside of the state if they're by people who are domiciled in the state. The Supreme Court has held that, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that for decades, and so has this court. And, Your Honor, I think it's also. Well, some transactions, I mean, if I buy a slice of pizza in New York, you can't tax me as the buyer, and you can't tax the seller. Sorry, Your Honor. passing it on to me as the yes. buyer. Yes, if sales of intangible assets or transfers of intangible assets like stocks or bonds, the Supreme Court has been very clear, and so has this court in Curry v. McCandless and Plasterer's estate, that those can be taxed regardless of where the transaction occurs. If there's some nexus with the state. Well, the, and the nexus is provided by the fact that the, the person who gets the benefit is domiciled here. They live here. They get the benefit of our court system, of our education so system, that, our roads. So the nexus is based on the income, not the transaction itself. Well, no, Your Honor. The, the person only receives income from the transaction. If there is a transaction, there has to be a transaction. And, and I think it's helpful to think about... Well, of course, but you're saying that the nexus with the state of Washington is the fact that me, as the seller of the stock in Washington, can put the money in my pocket in the state of Washington. That Your has Honor. nothing to do with the fact that the transaction might have occurred on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Your Honor, the exact same is true of the inheritance tax or the estate tax, which this court unanimously held that both were excise taxes. So, so the, regardless of where the person passed away, if the person inherits the money here, they owe the tax. And, 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 so, uh, and I think it's helpful to think about the legislature could have structured this tax so that every time a person engaged in a transaction, they owe the tax. 
and then at the end of the year, they got a refund if their total gains were less than a quarter of a million dollars. So more like Your Honor's example, just every time you make a sale, you owe the tax. Everything about that tax would have been substantively the same, the amount the person would owe, the incidence of the tax, the measure of the tax. But it would have been far more difficult for taxpayers, and it would have been far harder for the Department of Revenue to administer. And so there's nothing unconstitutional about the legislature choosing a simpler system that only requires payment at the end of the year and that uses federal forms and terminology to simplify things for everyone involved. Counsel, I have a slightly different question. Um, and the, the question is about the Culleton case. Um, I, I'm wondering, based upon your argument, if we're required to address that case or not. Under our argument, you're not required to address that case, Your Honor, because this tax is very clearly an excise tax under this court's case law. The same day the Supreme Court, this court decided Culleton, it also decided the Steiner case, uh, it, which upheld the business and occupation tax. And ever since then, uh, the court has been very clear that property taxes are taxes that apply merely because a person owns property. The other side agrees that that is the relevant test. And, and under that test, this tax does not work in that way. A person can own limitless stocks or bonds, can hold them for years, they can increase dramatically in value, and the person owes no tax that whole time. It is only when they sell the assets, when they sell the stocks or bonds, that they owe the tax. And that is why this is so clearly an excise tax, regardless of what the court held in Culleton and, uh, and other income tax cases. So is your argument then that because I'm a resident of the state of Washington and if I engaged in that transaction, met all of those requirements, uh, that's the reason why I, I would pay what you're describing as the income tax because of my residency? No, Your Honor. The, the, you owe the excise tax because you, you engaged in a sale or transaction that generated gains or you, re, you received those gains as a result of a sale or transaction. So let's say I receive, I, 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 I do the transaction, but it occurs in New York because I'm, that's where I'm selling the stock. Mm -hmm. um, and then my bank is not in the state of Washington. It's incorporated in Delaware, as many are. And I never spend the money here. Um, I use it to buy uh, something in Montana. Do I still owe the tax? Yes, Your Honor, and there's nothing constitutionally problematic about that. You receive the benefits of being domiciled here. You receive the benefits of the education system, the court system, the roads, the park system. But that's and what I don't understand. That sounds like because of my residency, I owe the tax. But it's not just because of your residency. It, it, your, your residency is, is part of it, but you, there has, you have to engage in a transaction to owe the tax. You could, you could own millions of dollars of stocks and bonds anywhere in the world uh, or, or, or here uh, and, and not owe the tax. The, the U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear that when you sell or transfer intangible assets, that can be taxed by the state where you live regardless of where that transfer or transaction occurred because you get the benefit of the protections of the state where you reside, where you're domiciled, uh, it, it doesn't have to be that only the state where the transaction actually happens can impose the tax. Now here, it's important to remember, if another state is taxing the same transaction under Washington's capital gains excise tax, you don't, you get a credit against your tax here. So you would not owe tax here. You would not be taxed twice for the same transaction by one state and Washington. But as a constitutional matter, it's very clear under, again, Curry versus McCandless from the U.S. Supreme Court, this court's decision in Plaster as a state, that a state where you are domiciled is allowed to tax your sales of intangible property wherever, wherever you make them. Because so, okay, but so how do I know which state, if I, let's say I have a home somewhere else, I'm living large in my, my hypothetical here. So let's say I have a home in another state, this transaction occurs, how do I know which place I'm supposed to pay this tax? Uh, Your Honor, it would depend where you are domiciled, which is a technical, uh, a technical matter. But I think all these questions also highlight, Your Honor, how problematic the plaintiff's facial challenge is in this case. They're basically saying, you know, think about these hypothetical examples where someone, you know, has houses in multiple states, spends time in all different parts of the country, Maybe they're the beneficiary of a trust somewhere else and all those things. If someone thinks they have a compelling claim that in a particular circumstance they're being taxed in a way that's illegal, they can bring a claim based on those facts. But here what you have is a law that in the run-of-the-mill case will apply when a person who lives in Washington... I think what the questions are designed to get at is whether the law taxes income or is taxing a transaction. 
And every time you answer that you here in Washington could put the money in your pocket and could benefit from it, you're telling me more and more that it's a tax on income. And we have to look at whether that's okay rather than that it's a tax on a transaction. I, I disagree, Your Honor, because there has to be a transaction. That is, the, that is what triggers the tax. You don't owe the tax just because you have income. You could have income from a million different sources without owing this tax. You only owe the tax if you sell or transfer capital assets and earn earn gains from doing that. So, so yes. But isn't that true of all income taxes? You only owe it if there was a transaction that netted you some income. Well, no, Your Honor. What this court Does said that in collapse the difference between the two. I don't think so, Your Honor, because what this court said in Culleton was the constitutional problem was that the tax applied no matter how you earned the income. It applied to all income wherever, or however you earned it. There was no way to earn income without owing that tax. Here, that is not remotely the case. There are countless ways to earn income without owing this tax. Less than one in 1,000 Washingtonians will owe the tax, and, and it applies only when there's a sale or transfer of capital assets. But what about dividends from those same taxes, from those same uh, stocks and bonds? If they're not sold but they're paying a dividend, if that amount is over, uh, does that get taxed under this scheme? Your Honor, that would not be subject to a capital gains tax. That might be subject to uh, that would not be subject to a capital gains tax because there hasn't been a sale or transfer. So, so no. So again, that's an example of how you can own limitless stocks or bonds without owing this tax in any given year. It's only if you sell them. Uh, I see that my time has expired. I'd like to turn things over to counsel for the interveners, uh, if if that's okay, and I'll be back up for the rebuttal. We'd ask that you uphold this tax. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Paul Lawrence. I'm here on behalf of interveners, the school districts, educators, and parents who would be the beneficiary of the capital gains tax. The appeal is first about the characterization of the capital gains tax, which Mr. Purcell has addressed. But the appeal is also about to decide whether, if the trial court was correct that this is an income tax, not an excise tax, should this court reevaluate and overturn uh, Culleton and its progeny, which hold that income taxes are property taxes under Washington law and subject to uh, the property tax limitations. As this court has said many times, stare decisis is not a straitjacket, it's not immutable. This court has several times overturned cases that are older than Culleton and its progeny. And there are two situations that trigger reevaluation, both of which apply in this case. One is where the legal underpinnings of prior case law have changed or disappeared. And second, where the decision is incorrect and is harmful. And as I said, both criteria applies. There are multiple reasons why Culleton and its progeny were incorrectly decided and based on legal pinnings that have changed. Uh, first, uh, while Colleton is, is routinely cited as having decided that uh, income is property under Washington law, the error there starts with the Aberdeen case, which if you look at the Culleton case, is the only case cited in, by the Culleton court for the proposition that an income tax is a property tax. And you go back and read Aberdeen, and it's very clear that the court did not address that question. The case was decided as a matter of the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. The court, at the end of their decision in Culleton, made clear that they were not uh, they were not deciding questions under the Washington Constitution. Can I pause and ask sure. you, so these arguments about the analytical flaws in Culleton um, started almost the minute Culleton was issued. So can you address how we look at um, a bench of nine, second guessing a former bench of nine, on arguments that were raised and dismissed in prior cases? Well, I think you, you're, the second part of your question is the problem here, is that the arguments that we are raising and the arguments why Culleton wrong have never really been thoroughly discussed by this court. The Aberdeen decision was misused by Culleton. There was not an analysis of whether or not income is property. For example, what a court, and I think this court would do, is look at the history of the 14th Amendment of the state constitution, which is the amendment that, that's at issue uh, here. That has never been evaluated by any court by any court in the state of Washington. And as we discuss in our briefing, the history of the 14th Amendment makes clear that the purpose was not to straitjacket 
the legislature, but to give greater leeway to the legislator to, to, to tax. And that, in fact, at the time, the proponents of that amendment supported an income tax, and the first thing both the people and the legislature did following enactment of that amendment was to adopt an income tax. The idea that the 14th Amendment was designed to stop an income tax simply is not supported by its history. Can I ask you? A, Go ahead. Does it make a difference, Council, that on the incorrect and harmful argument you're presenting, that we were conducting and deciding a constitutional issue? Here's one thing that troubled me a little bit about your arguments that I've, we've seen before. Um, is that it, it sort of stays away from the constitutional definition that we were in, interpreting in Culleton and afterwards. And if you look at that, is that definition or that resolution in Culleton that far afield from the definition that says property is everything, wherever it's located? Well, as, I mean, as, if that's our starting point, how is that incorrect? Well, Two things. First of all, as early as the Steiner case, this court moved away from the notion that everything is everything. They said that. They said, you know, they said it's true the Constitution defines property as anything subject to ownership, and in a sense, one's business and earnings are owed to him, but then goes on to allow privilege and excise tax based on that. So the, the so, claim that you're making today could equally uh, be presented if we were looking at the validity of Steiner. Uh, in, in part, but I think the point that I want to get at is that the everything language is not the key language of the amendment. What's key about the amendment is that it added intangible property to the definition of property. So everything ownership, it then goes property, tangible, and intangible. So the real question that was not directly addressed and which this court I'll get to in a second, has, in, has addressed inconsistently is whether income is intangible property. I don't think anyone says income is real property, but the argument is that income is intangible property. And this court has been very inconsistent in its treatment of income, sometimes treating it as intangible property, but often treating it as uh, as not. For example, the cases that Mr. Purcell talked about where you have income being taxed, uh, the gross income of a business, it's an excise tax. You also have uh, the case where this court upheld the taxation of the income of public employees ab uh, above a certain level. Now that looks exactly like an income tax, but was upheld by this court. So you have incredible inconsistency with the treatment of income by this court in addition to the errors of saying that Culleton affirmatively decided and affirmatively made a decision and looked at all these issues correctly. It, so, it did Mr. Not. Lawrence, do you think the state would agree with your characterization that those excise taxes are taxes on um, income? They are measured by income, but I think the state's argument is that if you have a transactional tax, tax based on transaction, but you don't, uh, and, and, and it's related to privileges that you get as a, as a part of your residency uh, uh, as Washington. But again, there's inconsistency there because it, it makes no sense to treat income from a business and in that case, that was held to be an excise tax based on the privileges that a business has. But income from a person is going to be treated like intangible property. The person has the same privileges of residency, the same protections um, from government as a business. This can I ask, I mean, your, your, your argument started with history. And they say, you know, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. So whatever makes sense under a particular logical approach, let me just ask this. Can you point to any example in Washington after the 14th Amendment that broadened property to include intangibles of an ad valorem in tax on intangible property? Sorry, that's a little unfair. I was just saying it's all about history and you don't have a book in front of you. But I just wonder if you can think of an example of uh, an ad valorem property tax on intangible property. 
Well, th there may be one in the future. Right now, real property, which is taxed on an assessment basis, the authority, I don't think there's any doubt that the state has the authority to tax ownership of stocks, bonds, and other intangibles. They just have chosen not to do that. Um, and, how, and how would that look um, as a tax? Well, I assume and, that and it would be... particularly in yeah. comparison to what we have in front of us. Yes, well, it would be very different. I think, like, like a real property, you get an assessment every year of what the value of your real property is. If you had stocks, I assume the state would adopt a date upon which your stocks would have value, and maybe you could look up in the stock market to see what your stocks were valued at that date, and then there would be a tax based on the valuation of the stocks. It does nothing to do with gains. It has nothing to do with transactions. It simply has to do with mere ownership of intangible property. And the same thing could be done with digital currency, I suppose. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I, I hopefully, I've never been involved in digital currency and never have educated myself about it. But if you're holding, if you're holding something for for uh, for investment purposes, like the, when if you take if you take cash and we put it into an annuity, uh, that would be uh, an intangible asset. If you put cash and put it into a savings account, so it's sitting there earning interest, that would be an intangible property. But the earning of income is not a tangible property, is the bottom line of our argument. So, so Council, you, you've been arguing the, um, the theory of the underpinnings having eroded as opposed to clearly erroneous. I assume that's because it is a very difficult line to draw. Every other state, except for Pennsylvania, which has a different language in their tax, in their state constitution, has held opposite to what this case. This, this state is an outlier. And one of the mistakes that the court made in Culleton was stating that the great weight of authority supported the idea that an income tax is property tax. That was wrong at the time. You can look at the Mills case out of Montana, which well, that's, seriously that's the, criticizes I'm sorry. it. I'm sorry. That's Go the, ahead. That's the underpinnings argument. My question is, are you not arguing clearly wrong, clearly erroneous standard? We're, ar we're arguing both. And, and so how, how do you get to clearly erroneous when it's so clearly a difficult line to draw? Well, I, part of it is because every other court, so pe let me just... That Pens sounds like underpinnings. <laughs> no, that's not underpinnings because I think that all, the, all these courts have dealt with the same issue whether income is property or not. Is an income tax a property tax or not? The only other state that has held that is, is in Pennsylvania, but their state constitution provides that all taxes, period, all taxes are subject to the property tax limitations. It doesn't distinguish between property taxes and non-property taxes. So that, that outlier is not helpful to this court. Every other state, every the scholars that have looked at this, routinely hold that an income tax is either an excise tax or sui generis, that is a tax unto itself, but it is not a property tax. So as a, as a legal analysis matter, it doesn't make sense that a uh, income tax is a property tax. And Thank you. Mr. Lawrence, your time has expired. You may briefly state the relief you request. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we believe that uh, this should be upheld as an excise tax, but if it's treated as an income tax, this court should reevaluate Colleton and its progeny, progeny, overturn those cases, and provide, again, the inherent powers that the legislature has to make taxing decisions that are fair and equitable and that provide valuable in revenue to service what the state needs to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Castillo. Thank you, Your Honors. Chief Justice Gonzalez, may it please the court. Callie Castillo for the Quinn respondents. This morning, I'm going to highlight the focus of why the capital gains tax is unconstitutional. My colleague, Mr. McKenna, will address the issues of stare decisis. Do you mind just lowering the mic a little bit? Thank you. The capital gains tax is unconstitutional for three independent reasons, which this court need only reach one to invalidate the tax. The tax is a non-uniform property tax on individual income. It violates the state privileges and immunities clause, and it burdens interstate commerce in violation of the United States Commerce Clause. 
I'm going to focus only on the Article 7 and the Commerce Clause arguments today, unless this court has specific questions related to the privileges and immunities. The capital gains tax is not a valid excise tax, as the state argues. The label of excise does not match how the tax actually operates or it functions. This court has said that an excise tax is imposed on the taxpayer for engaging in a voluntary act that triggers the taxable event and is measured by the taxable activity. But here, the capital gains tax does not meet any one of those elements. First of all, you do not have to be a party to any transaction in order to be subject to the tax. The plain language of the statute says that the tax is imposed when an individual recognizes capital gains on their federal income tax forms, and that is the subject of the tax, the income, not the transaction. Second of all, the state has identified no privilege to tax individuals who engage in activity outside of this state. The state is simply wrong that the state has authority to tax the sale of intangibles that occur outside of this state, and the United States Supreme Court has made that clear in multiple ca taxations. Can it I ask a Commerce cases. Clause argument, Counselor, or the Article 7 argument? Mm. The, the, with respect to the authority that is under the Commerce Clause, but what it establishes is why the tax in its operation and effect is not an excise tax. It is a property tax under this court's authority because it is a tax on income. Go ahead. The state has conferred no right or privilege to impose the alleged excise here. The state does not, mere receipt of income is not a privilege that this state imposes on its citizens. Council, do you make a distinction between this, the way this tax works and or the real estate excise tax? Yes, Your Honor. In the real estate excise tax, it is imposed on the party engaged in the transaction. It is based on the individual transaction of the sale of the real property, and it is measured by the purchase price of the property. It he, is that not a form of income? So ultimately, if I sell a house for more than I paid for it, it, it that, that gain is, is income in some form. So I put it in the bank, I can spend it in the same way that I could, if I conducted a transaction like this, I could put it in the bank and spend it. That is correct, Your Honor. But the distinction, though, is that in the real estate excise tax, you're not being taxed on the income that you made on that sale. If you have a loss on your sale of, of the real property, you still owe the real estate excise tax on the amount that you sold it to the purchaser. It makes no difference whether you have a earn, you earn gain or you lose gain with respect to the real estate excise tax. And what this court said for the real estate excise tax is that the privilege is on the individual engaging in selling their real property. But here you have the capital gains tax that plainly applies to individuals who take no action. For example, if I'm a beneficiary of a trust that is held in another state, New York, for example, and the trustee, which is the legal owner of that property, has some action, Washington tries to then impose the tax on myself as the mere beneficiary. I've engaged in no action, in order, no transaction to sell that property, which is legally owned outside of the state by another entity. Well, so, I, I think the argument by the state is that you you still benefit from the actions of the state by driving on the roads, by sending your children to school, what, whatever those things are that you gain as the benefit of the resident of the state of Washington. How do you deal with that? Argument? Because the distinction is, is the state is trying to say that this particular, the capital gains tax, is on the transaction of selling the real or, or excuse me, the tangible or intangible property. 
But in your scenario, um, Your Honor, there is no transaction that the, st that the resident of the state of Washington is engaged in. The only privilege that could be identified is the receipt of income, which this court in, in has rejected as being a privilege offered by the state of the Washington. Okay, but your, that argument depends, sorry, that argument depends upon your hypothetical that you as the beneficiary have done nothing. But what if you have done something? What if you decide I'm going to sell stock today and you make a gain? That seems to defeat the argument that you're making that it could affect someone who doesn't do anything. The, the, first of all, the capital gains tax applies in both such scenarios. Yes, but, but for intangible, but your your argument seems to be uh, dependent upon the idea that it could affect someone who did nothing, but it could also affect someone who did something. So, tell me what how you resolve and, that. And that's the, that's the struggle with what this court is looking at and what exactly is the state attempting to tax here. And all of the signs that point to is it's not the subject of the tax isn't that transaction. So it doesn't matter whether it's a capital gains within the state or outside the state for purposes of the type of tax argument. That certainly has implications for the United States Constitution. But the issue, though, is, is that there still is the problem of the intangibles in that the state of Washington is, is allocating to itself all intangibles simply because the individual is domiciled here in the state of Washington. So now, now you're talking about the Dormant Commerce Clause? Yes. So before you move on to that, can yes. I ask you again about the characterization? Because in your briefing, too, you rely heavily on your, your understanding of what a voluntary action is for purposes of excise. And so going back to the hypothetical you were giving about someone who's a beneficiary of assets sold outside of the state and realizes a gain subject to this tax, how do you distinguish that in terms of characterizing the tax as an excise versus an income tax um, from the estate or the inheritance tax? That solely goes to what privilege is being taxed. And in the hypothetical where you're a beneficiary who's taken no action and the only reason why the tax applies is because you recognize that income, this court has to determine what then is the privilege being taxed on that person. If it well, is the mere... Let me pause there and say, because again, I want you to, to, I'd like you to talk about why is this distinguishable from the tax we dealt with in Hamilton, because what I'm looking at is if it's the transaction that's being taxed, that's the taxable incident. Who pays it might just be, you know, where does the money end up? That's not necessarily what is being taxed, right? It's, it's the taxable incident is, is an incident. It's not necessarily an individual, and that's what seems to be getting collapsed in your hypothetical. Well, even in the, um, the state tax, the the transaction that what is being taxed is the privilege of transferring the the decedent's property to another person. That is what this court has recognized is the incident of the tax. It's that privilege of instead of escheating to the state of having the privilege of giving it to somebody else. But the who is being taxed is the estate, the person engaged in the transact the a state, but is party. the who is being taxed feature the defining characteristic of what makes it an excise versus an income tax? No, Your Honor, no. it's it's a it's a total of all of the pieces. It's who is being taxed. It is what is being taxed. What is the measure of the subject matter being taxed? And here, for all purposes, for the capital gains tax, that is the measure. The, it is income, and in which under this court's precedent, income is property and, sub and subject to the constitutional limits in Article 7. Before you move to the Dormant Commerce Clause, can you take a moment to talk about the standard of review here? Uh, I've always found it curious to read cases that say the person challenging uh, legislation as unconstitutional has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, the constitutionality, and I don't understand how that works when it's a one thing or the other thing test. Tell me what we're doing here and what standard we use to evaluate your claims. Well, first of all, be specific to this case, 
this court need not actually decide what type of tax the um, capital gains tax is because on its face it violates the dormant commerce clause beyond a reasonable doubt. But if this court were to decide that it is a property tax, then it also plainly, with beyond a reasonable doubt, violates Article 7 because it is not uniform and the tax rate exceeds that 1% tax limit. So the standard of review here is whether this court, on the face of the statute, whether it violates both of those constitutional provisions, this Article 7 of the state constitution and the Commerce Clause, and the plain language of its entirety does. The state is trying to make this distinction in that the plaintiffs here were not, have not been subject to the tax. But that is not the standard of review um, in terms of a constitutionality under the Dormant Commerce Clause, because it is the operation and effect that matters based on the language. A taxpayer need not suffer any sort of harm in order for a tax to be stricken down under the Dormant Commerce Clause. Can I, maybe I need to clarify there, because I didn't see there being any standing issue in front of us, um, and, and I'm not sure I understood that the beyond a reasonable doubt uh, nomenclature, which like Chief Justice Gonzalez, I find, um, and we've addressed that to some extent, uh, what that means, I'm not sure it equates one-to-one um, -one with the nature of a facial challenge. I see those as different questions. But maybe you could explain what you're getting at there, because I see this as a facial challenge. You're saying in no application could this tax stand under those two provisions. Am I misunderstanding the argument? No, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I was picking up on um, what my colleague, um, Mr. Purcell, had used in saying that this is in saying that the plaintiffs had, um, this tax had not been applied. But you're absolutely correct, Your Honor, in that our arguments are on the face, this, this tax statute violates both constitutional provisions. So would you say, and again, you don't see a standing argument in front of us, do you? Correct. Okay. So would you say that if the court can identify a single instance in which this tax could be applied consistent with those constitutional provisions, we would have to uphold it? No, Your Honor, because first of all, under, um, the, under the federal principles, that is not the standard that the United States Supreme Court uses in challenges to state taxes under the Dormant Commerce Clause. Because the United States has said that a taxpayer need not, um, even if there are some ways that a tax can be constitutionally applied, it doesn't save the tax because of the invalidity because of the impact on interstate commerce. And the best example of that are the constitutional challenges that occurred um, multiple years ago to Washington's B&O tax system, in which both the cases of Gwynn, um, Prince, and Hennaford, the United States Supreme Court struck down the B&O tax provision that was being challenged, even though it could have been constitutionally applied to to solely in-state Washington business. So your argument depends on being meritorious on the Dormant Commerce Clause because it's not the same standard of review we would use under the state constitution, is it? Well, I think the distinction, Your Honor, is that under – it's not the same um, for the Commerce Clause. This court has said for state tax – for state constitutional purposes, it has applied that – um, constitutional beyond a reasonable doubt, whatever that means. But the issue is, is that if this court decides that this is a property tax because it is a tax on income, it is unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt. There are no circumstances. And if we, if we determine instead it's an excise tax, what then? Under Washington, um, if it's an excise tax, you would still, you would satisfy the constitutional privilege, um, excuse me, the constitutional um, principles for excise taxes because the state has broad authority. But that would not solve any problem under the United States Commerce Clause. So this, there's a circular problem here in that this tax cannot stand either under the state constitution or the federal constitution, no matter what type. It, this court ultimately decides. And in fact, this court need not decide what type it is because of the federal constitutional problems. In, in the Commerce Clause argument, 
and I'm going to get dizzy thinking of all I don't know about the Commerce Clause. Is there a nexus component to that analysis? There is a nexus component in that the Do, Does your argument rely on the out-of-state nature of certain transactions? Yes, there's three components to the constitutional problems under the Commerce Clause. First, the state only has the power to tax activities that occur within its territorial borders. That's the nexus problem. And we've discussed why it cannot impose that tax on sales of intangibles outside of this or activity on intangibles outside of the state, as well as for tangible property. There's also a fair apportionment problem in that this statute has no um, – it allocates all of the income to Washington regardless of whether there's any sort of transaction in New York or New Hampshire. And it also violates – because it discriminates in multiple aspects by subjecting that income to risk of multiple state taxation. I now yield the balance of the argument to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McKenna. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, Rob McKenna for the Clayton plaintiffs. The capital gains tax is not an excise tax. It's an income tax. Every taxing authority in our nation, from the IRS on down, treats taxes on capital gains as income taxes because capital gains are income. Do those other jurisdictions treat income taxes as property taxes or as excise or sui generis taxes? They treat them as uh, income taxes. In our state, income, the law is that income is property. I you can have an income that. tax if, if it meets the requirements for property taxes. But out of state, how many other jurisdictions say that a tax on income is a property tax? Our court, this court, and our laws rely on what our Constitution says. And the U.S. Supreme Court observed in Hale v. Iowa Board that the definition of property is up to the states. And in that decision, they actually cite Calton and Jensen v. Hennerford as examples of a state which has defined income as property. Calton court and every court, all of your predecessors since then, have held that what matters for our purposes in this state is what our Constitution says. It, the Calton court rejected reliance on other state constitutions, other state authorities. They also didn't just rely on Aberdeen. The Culleton Court observed that Aberdeen, which was a decision handed down in June of, 19, uh, of June of 1930, was decided before the voters approved Amendment 14 to the Constitution in November of 1930. And the Culleton Court pointed out that when the voters approved that amendment, adopting a definition of property as broad as can be imagined, more than any the, the most profound lexicographer uh, could, could uh, come up with, they said that the voters made income as pro part of property part of our fundamental law. And not I'm, a single court since then ha in our state has questioned that conclusion based on the plain language of the Constitution. So the question I asked, Mr. Lawrence, do we put the Call it, I'll just say the Culleton case under a different lens than when we're reviewing the claim that is incorrect and harmful when we're really defining what the Constitution yeah. says. And I, I ask that question because in pr earlier cases, um, the observation has been made that if we want to solve whatever problem might be presented uh, in a constitutional sense, you amend the Constitution. Correct. And the Carlton Court made that point as well, Your Honor, because the Carlton decision was about a voter-approved initiative in 1932 that would have allowed, uh, created a progressive income tax. And the Carlton Court simply pointed out that just as the legislature cannot amend the Constitution legislatively, the voters cannot amend the Constitution by adopting a piece of legislation. The m way forward is to amend the Constitution. In this case, it would involve amending the Constitution to exclude income come from the definition of property, to overturn the Culleton rule. And in fact, the voters of the state have had six opportunities to do just that. Six times the state legislature, beginning in the 1930s and into the 1970s, six times the legislature has mustered two-thirds majorities to send to the voters an amendment to the Constitution, to Article 7, Section 1, that would exclude income from property, which 
in every case has been rejected by the voters. Counsel, so here you we... have confirmation or affirmation of the Calton rule by the voters in considering those constitutional amendments and rejecting them. As a follow-up to that, what do we do with the fact that the Culleton decision, uh, the analysis in the Culleton decision itself, in hindsight, is not really perfect? Its statement about the great weight of authority in the states is not completely it, accurate. Nevertheless, its conclusion might well reflect the expansiveness of our state constitutional provision that property is anything and everything. Correct, Your Honor. The, there is dicta in that in that opinion, uh, uh, referring to the overwhelming overwhelming judicial authority. But what the court relies on in that case is the plain language of Article Seven, Section One, adopted by Amendment Fourteen, that that income or that property is everything tangible and intangible subject to ownership. And they conclude that income is a form of intangible property subject to ownership. But because to conclude otherwise would be to tell the people of the state they don't own their incomes, and not only did the Culleton court reach that decision, but every decision of this court since then has recognized that under this state's constitution, income is property. That doesn't mean we can't have a property, uh, ha can't have an income tax. That's a misconception. We can have an income tax in this state because income is a form of intangible property, and Amendment 14 was offered and approved precisely to encompass, to bring within the ambit of property taxes, income. As so a form, an intangible. Can I see then this? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish your line. What do you do with the state's argument that um, uh, we don't, that income is not property, that we don't own income? Well, I haven't heard the state argue that income is not property. I've heard the interveners argue that income is You're not correct. property because. Unfortunately, the mic did pick up that mistake <laughs> of mine. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the argument finds no support in law. I mean, first of all, oh, the only law that matters is the law of our state, not Pennsylvania's law. Pennsylvania struck down its income tax because it wasn't uniform. They have a uniformity requirement for all taxes. Our state constitution imposes a uniformity requirement on property taxes. So we could have an income tax in the state today if it met the requirements for property taxes. We could have a progressive or graduated income tax in this state next year if the voters approved an amendment to the constitution eliminating the uniformity requirement. And in fact, Two bills have been introduced in the legislature this month that would eliminate the uniformity requirement in the Constitution. So those legislators, like legislatures going back to the 1930s, have recognized that in order to have a progressive income tax, we need to amend the Constitution to exclude income from that definition of property so that it's not limited by that definition. The other point, if I may, Your Honors, I would like to make uh, is uh, in response to some things that uh, Solicitor General Purcell has said. What's important when considering the excise tax at issue here, or the alleged excise tax, the capital gains tax, is the incidence of the tax. The incidence of the tax is not exercise of a privilege to sell or exchange property because the, t the law itself says in Section 5 that the tax applies when Washington capital gains are recognized. So you could have... 100 transactions, sales and exchanges over the course of the year. And if you recognize no net income, there's no tax. That's because the incidence of this tax is not the sale or exchange of a long-term capital asset. The incidence of the tax is the recognition of income, as the Act itself clearly so, states. So could I ask you, and I, will, I do have another question related sure. uh, to the property tax issue, but on that, Ms. Ms. Castillo distinguishes the real estate excise tax because it's the, pr the sale price um, essentially the sale that's being taxed. Right. So under the argument you just made, which I think dovetails with that distinction, would a constitutional, I guess would a, a cleanup to this capital gains tax meet your definition of an excise tax if it simply didn't net it out? If it just said whenever there's a sale of a capital asset that results in a gain of a certain amount, we're taxing that sale. That would correct one flaw in the tax for sure, because then the incident of the tax would be the sale or exchange. But what it wouldn't solve is the problem that this tax attempts to, to tax income from transactions outside of the state over which the state has no jurisdiction. Okay, so that, that still, dormant so commerce you've, clause you've got, argument. Third, it would not solve the problem that the real estate excise tax is imposed on 
uh, the parties to the transaction to the legal owner. This tax is imposed on income recognized by, among others, beneficial owners who aren't parties to the transaction, who have not engaged in a voluntary transaction. So this tax, uh, could, could an excise tax be created on the sale or transfer of long-term capital assets? Yes, if it applied to the parties to the transaction, if the activity was limited to the activity within the state of Washington, not, so, not outside the state of Washington, and so forth. Okay, so my, the question I asked opposing counsel, and um, it goes back to the 14th Amendment, which encompasses intangible property. Um, can you give me an example of an ad valorem property tax on intangibles? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Uh, property, you know, you know well, there are two. There, there are uh, two kinds of taxes. There are in, there are excise taxes and there are property taxes. Excise taxes are indirect; they're voluntary and they're imposed for the exercise of a substantive privilege granted by the state. Property taxes are direct taxes that are unavoidable. That's why an income tax is a property tax because it is a direct tax on you. The, in, the owner of the income, and you can't avoid it once you've recognized the income. And this is why I'm asking the question is, um, and I'm sorry, I, I should have brought the side in with me, but there is a, yeah. a little statute in the tax code that says the legislature shall not impose ad valorem property taxes on intangible property. Why? I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, Your, Your Honor. I think, uh, I think what matters for the present analysis is that uh, an income, you know, is that a tax to be an excise tax has to meet the elements of the law established by this court. I mean, this isn't just about stare decisis for income as property. This is about your, your, overruling your precedents. It's what the state is asking you to do is to effectively overrule your precedents on excise taxes, so because Mr. you would have McKenna, to find. I have a question about. Yes, Justice this Montreal Lewis. Relevant to, I think, is relevant to this point. So you started in your argument talking about various attempts to bring this question to the electorate. Yes. Okay. So, and I know you're, it, it, well, this is the question. It seems to me that some of your argument related to what you were just saying about precedent as well is dependent upon the vote of the electorate. So the electorate could change the definition. The definition of income, Your Honor? Yes. Do you agree with that? They could change the, they could, they could vote to amend the Constitution to exclude income from the definition of property, and they've had six opportunities to do that, as a matter of fact. So the definition, therefore, is not static. It is, that's correct. The question is, what is the process to be followed? This court observed in 1960 uh, uh, in a case involving uh, an excise on rental income that if you want to tax income, you have to amend the Constitution. It was a procurium opinion, one page issued by the court, because this court had seen this again and again and again. There is nothing new under the sun when it comes to this issue in the sense that trying to call an income tax an excise trying to tax income by imposing an excise on the privilege of receiving income has been t tried several times in this state by the state legislature, and it's been struck down every time because it's not an excise when it's a tax on income because income taxes are unavoidable, and uh, excise taxes to be excises have to be uh, avoidable and the result of a substantive privilege. The, the question but about it the is avoidable if I, may, if I choose yeah. not to make the transaction. Uh, it is I don't not. have to make the transaction. I don't have to sell. But, the, but what's not being taxed here isn't the transaction. You could have 100 transactions. There's no tax on them. It's when you recognize income that the tax applies. This is the importance of the incidence of the tax analysis. The, the job but of the judicial... This, this, is, this is the crux of the problem I'm having with your argument. So you're saying it's only taxable income after you make the transaction, you realize a gain, and the gain is over $250,000, correct? That, that sounds like uh, a definition that can be modified that is not a static definition, which to me... Uh, implicates your argument around precedent and when when this court should go back and look at something uh, because um, it's an incorrect and harmful decision that does not take into account the, the nature of the of changes like that. Justice Montoya Lewis, this court said in Steiner v. Yell, the case upholding the B&O tax, that when you acquire income, it becomes your property. 
the, the, the incident of the B&O tax is not the acquisition of income. The incident of the B&O tax is the conduct of business. And they point out that you, unless you have a privilege to conduct business, you don't have an opportunity to acquire income. But what matters is the incident of the tax. That's, and, and this court has to decide what the incident is. What is it really attached to? My point, Justice Montoya Lewis, to answer your question, is that this tax we're talking about today, it doesn't attach to the sale or exchange. It attaches to the recognition of income. If you don't recognize income that you've reported on your federal tax return, you don't owe anything. All those sales and exchanges is, uh, you know, are, 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 are of no matter, of no moment to the, to the state. All that matters is recognizing income. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. And McKenna, then you have to pay the tax. Is, the request it, it, we would relief, your, the request that uh, we have for you, Your Honor, for the court, is to uphold the trial court's decision in finding that this tax is an income tax, but that it's unconstitutional because it does not conform to the requirements for property, the requirements for property taxes that are of a uniformity and a 1% limitation. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal, please. Thank you, Your Honor. There's five points I'm hoping to make if time will allow. Mr. So, Purcell, I hope you'll address that. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, sorry. Uh, I hope you'll address the last point first, if you would. The last point, sorry. Which the last point by, made by Mr. McKenna um, as to the incidents, what, you know, that you're not taxing the transaction. Well, you're, you are. Uh, absolutely, I'm happy to. So as I said before, if the legislature restructured this tax so that you had to pay it every time you engaged in a transaction, it would be substantively identical, except that it would be far more difficult for taxpayers to comply with and for the department to comply with. But there would be no substantive <coughs> difference. The measure of the tax would be the same. The incidence of the tax would be the same. The amount you would owe would be the same. It would be the same. So, so, and to give a flip side of that, under the other side's theory, suppose the legislature changed the real estate excise tax and said, you know what, instead of taxing the whole amount of the sale, we're just going to tax how much your property went up in value since you bought it. Under their theory, that tax becomes unconstitutional overnight just because the legislature changes the, the, uh, you know, the measure from the total sale amount to the profit you earned. That makes absolutely no sense. So your, your position is that it's, it's um, uh, just how you measure what you owe. Is that essentially it? Yes, and this court has said many, many times that the measure of a tax can be income. The court said that in Steiner. The court even said that in Power versus Huntley. That doesn't turn it into an income tax. The, what, what's taxed here is the transaction, and the measure of the tax is how much you earn, but that does not turn it into an income tax. Um, I also want to make sure to address the other side's point about pass-through entities, and there's, there's a couple points I'd like to make about that. So first of all, I think it's very telling that their lead example is not an ordinary case where someone sells their own stocks or bonds, like Justice Montoya Lewis pointed out, but instead they have to reach for this kind of strained example. Uh, and, and it's telling because, Your Honor, but even as to that strained example, it's still not a property tax. It's not a tax you owe just because you own property. You can own shares in an S corporation or be the beneficiary of a trust without owing this tax. It's only if there is a transaction that generates capital gains that you owe the tax. But they're saying that the, the incident there is the receipt of the income, not the sale of the property. That what, it ties into the argument about it not being voluntary. Well, and Your Honor, I would say look at the inheritance tax that this court unanimously held in Berkeley's estate is an excise tax. There, the person who owes the tax, all they do, literally all they do, is they get an inheritance. They get a check. They do nothing else. <clears throat> and this court held that is an excise tax. You're being taxed on the privilege of receiving that inheritance. Here, the person is not only receiving the benefits of the transaction, they're also choosing to participate in this legal structure, this whatever it may be, S corporation, pass-through entity, trust. They've gotten benefits from that tax structure for years. There's, there's nothing, uh, there, if, if, if it's an excise tax to tax just because you received an inheritance, it's clearly an excise tax to tax that level of transaction. Mr. Purcell, can I just ask you, uh, I, as briefly as I can, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's settled law that if I'm an enrolled tribal member and I live and work on my reservation, that, that uh, income is not taxable by the state, correct? With me on that? So far, yes. Okay, so if, I, if that is my circumstance, I live and work on my reservation where I'm an enrolled tribal member and I engage in one of these uh, sales and realize a capital gain that is over the amount of $250,000. Do I owe the tax? 
Your Honor, there has been no... Uh, I know there's no law. Th there's That's no, not no, my question. <laughs> uh, I suppose a person could bring an as-applied... Uh, there's multiple layers where the department would review a claim like that. A person could say, I should not owe the tax because I'm a tribal member and I live on the reservation, and, um, and the department would review it, and the department has authority itself to not apply a tax where it would be unconstitutional. A person could also bring an as-applied challenge. I'm not prepared to give an across-the-board answer to that question right now because, uh, you know, Tax law, as we've all been, is very complex, and especially when you add in the elements of tribal immunity and tribal sovereignty. So, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to speculate about something that's not presented, which is all the more reason emphasizing why uh, the facial nature of this challenge is problematic. Mm -hmm. If I could say one other thing, it would just be that every, virtually every other state has a capital gains tax, and yet the other side has not cited a single case striking down any of those on dormant commerce clause grounds. So, you would think that. While this area is confusing and complicated, as Justice Johnson pointed out, you would think that at least one of those would have been struck down on dormant commerce clause grounds, and yet not a single case. Thank you. Uh, you your time has expired. You may briefly summarize the relief you request. Your Honors, we ask that you uphold the tax, and because the tax is first due on April 18th and because the legislative session will be ending shortly after that, we ask that to the extent you are able, you expedite your ruling to try to rule as, as quickly as possible and, if necessary, issue an order with opinion to follow so that people have certainty before the tax is due and the legislature has certainty before the are session ends. Are you asking us to, uh, to adhere to that deadline because of the needs of the parties to this case or because of a need external to this case? Well, Your Honor, I think it would benefit, the, the state of Washington would benefit, the legislature and the governor would benefit from having certainty in budget writing, and I think taxpayers would benefit from having certainty that about, you know, whether the tax is due and so on. So, so yes, to the parties. Isn't that true in all cases? <laughs> Everyone would like to know. Of course, today. Your Honor, of course. I, my point is simply that the tax is due on April 18th, and the legislative session is proceeding right now with budget writers, you know, factoring in whether this revenue will be available and so on. So we just asked the court to move as, as, well, as quickly me, as it can. Let me just make sure that I understand. We, we have given the state, uh, based on procedures before this court, the opportunity to, to collect these taxes, correct? The state, yes, the state allows the, the, the state to collect the taxes. That was a request by the state. It, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Your Honors. All right, thank you to counsel for the briefing and the oral argument. Uh, the case is submitted. We are in recess for 10 minutes. All rise. Court is in recess.